Thank you very much, uh, and good evening to everyone. Uh, I'm here with uh, Shemistri, uh, another director of Guwahati, and uh, I'm going to talk about uh, very briefly an introduction of who we are, what we do. Then we're going to see what are the benefit of an agile architecture practice. So if we have to introduce into an architecture team. Uh, and uh, agile impacts of uh, 2D architecture and design practice. So for a, pra for a practice that has never seen it before, what's changing really? Uh, what kind of deliverables do we need to introduce and uh, what's their impact? Uh, have you implemented a design framework? We're just gonna talk about design frameworks uh, very quickly and see how they can support also the introduction of an agile mindset and also large scale transformations using agile. And then uh, lessons learned, and then a quick demo, uh, just to cheer you up because it's quite late. So uh, we're going to start uh, with uh, an introduction with Bruhati. Uh, we're an organization that uh, is, uh, is, is delivering professional services uh, with, for large organization across the country and the world. Uh, we, the latest big uh, agile transformation we have done, so we're digital transformation experts, uh, was a two two where we replace all their IT systems and we use the scaled agile approach based on the SAFE framework. We're currently supporting uh, NHS on uh, high profile programs, uh, uh, COVID related and uh, uh, British Red Cross. We offer products in uh, uh, strategy and architecture, agile and delivery, business transformation and cloud services. Uh, let's start with a question now. If you don't mind helping me out here, if someone is writing down the, the answers, uh, just play them out to me. I can't see the, the screen. So what are the benefits of introducing an agile architecture and design practice? So for the one of you that are in the delivery team, and uh, what do you think is the benefit of being agile? Any answer? Okay, I'll go on then. Um, well, I think we need to talk about objectives, way to achieve our objectives, and then what are the outcomes of being able to have an agile architecture team. Uh, in uh, On the left, you can see that in order to achieve an agile architecture practice, we spoke about the mindset, but then in practice, also, you have to look into having architecture assurance frameworks that support that introduction and the governance around it. You need to make sure that the artifacts that are delivered are also supporting uh, an agile uh, methodology and uh, making sure that you learn and get confident with the concept of emergent architecture. We're not gonna talk about it. You probably know that already, it's a safe terminology. Um, what kind of outcomes can you have? Well, if you do it correctly and uh, you use the right frameworks and tools, you have uh, a repository of knowledge that you're going to build up. You can be able to control costs better, have more governance, increase the return on investment, improve your end-to-end -end traceability, have visibility around the organization, because as the other panelists were saying today, it's about being part of a team and being seen there and being able to deliver more impact as well in the organization. So there's a lot of benefits. Now, let's see if someone wants to join uh, on other questions. Uh, the second question we have here is, what are the agile impacts to the architecture and design team? So if we are introducing agile, we've never seen it before. For the one of you which are uh, in the architecture team or design or any way, delivery. OK, so the answer is, unless feel free to interrupt me eh, if uh, you want to jump in. Um, we need more governance. Uh, an agile architecture team has to be able to govern the continuously uh, changing and fast-paced environment that they are in, especially in a large agile transformation when you have uh, over 600 people involved only in the, in the core team and you have an, up to 20 squads. Uh, unless you introduce governance, you won't be able to support effectively the organization. Uh, parallel work, you know that it's an element uh, that uh, is seen very much. It's not only about iteration, it's also about multiple iteration running in parallel. And uh, 
in the uh, architecture and design team, we are originally used to see enterprise architects doing their roadmaps, uh, solution architects doing their release architectures and system architects then looking at the system uh, design. This can be compressed, this can be seen in parallel. Multiple options are open, as we're going to see. We need much more synergy between the, the teams. Roadmaps, they are, yes, strategic, but in the end, as SAFE calls them, we have architecture runways. So we are going to see how can we achieve the maximum benefit in the very shortest term. Emergent architecture, that's really important. Usually, uh, organizations that haven't seen large agile transformation, uh, they're not used to the continuous impact to the architecture that uh, a large agile program has. And uh, controlling the changes to the architecture is something that uh, requires some skill and a specific framework. We're going to see that in a minute. Working a lot with planning. Uh, uh, so architecture and design teams working very closely to program and project management is even more important now. Some organizations think the uh, architects should be in the rivalry, rivalry tower, but that's wrong also for, an, uh, for, for a water approach or any other approach. But more, more, you're mostly in agile, uh, there should be a, a very good cohesion between teams. Focusing on near-term features, making sure that the systems as well and the technologies we're using um, are able to support continuous delivery, like uh, we spoke about cloud uh, technologies, we spoke about serverless, we spoke about containerized technologies, and variability. Things can be open uh, until very close to delivery, because as you know, uh, the definition of the scope tends to be closed, uh, quite close to uh, the release delivery date. So we need to make sure that we are ready with, to address different options, also depending on the amount of dependencies we're working with. So another question, do you need the architecture deliverables in agile transformation? This is, this is about, okay, uh, we are introducing agile, so we don't need documentation anymore, right? Well, no. And uh, uh, this is an example of, uh, before we get to the documentation and see a bit of what we have done and uh, how we managed to introduce an agile mindset for a very large transformation. This is an example of a team. And uh, we spoke about guilds. So it's quite exciting that we're seeing yet another type of organization. So this is what we used in the past for a very, very large delivery, I, I was saying before. Uh, we had 21 uh, uh, squads in parallel. Squads are taking a set of scope and they're delivering it from epic definition to all the user stories and a refinement and then delivery of those. So they have that responsibility. Uh, but how do we make sure that all of these work together and they are working uh, on the same direction or against each other? And we also reduce duplication and we unlock uh, issues. Uh, there are always issues. So we need uh, a level of control on top. Uh, and what we've seen here was introducing a business a squad or squad team, which is looking after unlocking all the business issues and supporting from a business perspective and a technical one, which is doing the same from a technical perspective. And then because we have to control the emerging architecture, we need another layer there, the architecture and design board, which is helping to bridge the uh, delivery work with the strategic view of, of what we want to achieve. Then in terms of proper deliverables, uh, in very large transformations, you can't get away without a blueprint. And uh, this is something that can be created uh, using different means. It depends on also the tool set you have. But it's really important to, to, for these documents also to be delivered on time and to be uh, iterated iterated as much as possible. Because the earlier they're visible to the whole ecosystem, the, the better uh, it is for the program, reducing risk and increasing chance of success. Um, domain HLDs are used when you have very large transformation and you want to break up your scope in different domains. You still need to make sure that uh, you have low-level designs and design and, and deliverable assurance is also important there. Uh, let's remember that uh, Agile mindset, it doesn't mean that the whole organization is agile. And when you have suppliers, uh, many times they want to stay stick to their way of delivering. 
that and having this documentation helps to control. Sorry for the scary slide. I'll try to break it down for you and make it a bit more easier. Here, there are just a couple of uh, concepts we really want to come to get through. So the first one is, um, as you can see on top, we have a couple of colors. We have uh, a, a green and a, and a red one. And uh, they are highlighting uh, the difference between a fully connected and a disconnected organization. We're going to talk about it in a second. Secondly, we're trying to explain what artifacts we need to, to deliver uh, in large agile transformations. And uh, on top, you can see what we call in Bruhati the digital transformation value chain. The digital transformation value chain is nothing but a set of phases that every large transformation has to follow. And there is a level of iteration. It can be an iteration that you will see at a release level. And also within delivery, you have your sprints. But uh, in terms of deliverables, you start as an act, we're still talking about architecture and design here. You start with architecture vision and strategy. We need to define roadmaps and release architectures. We need an enterprise architecture repository of reference. That's why I was talking about having a repository before. Without that, it's really easy to lose control. You have 21 squad working on it, so you have to have the right tools. Um, you need to be able to when you're in delivery, validate processes, entity, data entities, application impacts, interfaces, making sure that uh, if you're running multiple stacks, uh, those are uh, quite clear. What kind of strategy are we having? How do we migrate? These are challenges that you will see also in a, in a classic, as an example, waterfall uh, delivery. But the big important point here is having a reference architecture and design framework. Without a reference architecture and design framework, it's really difficult to control a large transformation using Agile, also using waterfall. Uh, ready for scale and service performance are also other activities that need to be looked at from architecture into service. Now, let's make it a bit more complicated, no, a bit easier, hopefully. Uh, what frameworks have you implemented? So, I mean, I'm really interested to understand, and maybe you can write down the questions we'll talk about later. Uh, have you ever seen a framework? Do you know what it is? And uh, what's your opinion on that? Uh, in Brati, we have uh, some assurance frameworks that we uh, defined. These are based on best practice and the experience we had delivering uh, large transformations. And uh, we can see that uh, there are two, ADAF and ADDF here, where ADAF uh, looks at assurance of architecture and, and design across uh, the whole transformation from strategy to portfolio to delivery and service. And ADDF instead is looking into when I'm delivering, how can I deliver across business, delivering solution layer in the most effective way? How can we make them work? And uh, now that everything is remote, this is even more important. Teams don't see each other. So how can we create that cohesion? We need process, we need frameworks, we need templates and tools. And that's how we manage to get control over this uh, uh, large agile transformation. So uh, just to wrap this up, in order to develop an agile mindset, we think you need to make sure that you address resistance to change. And we saw that in the other uh, uh, talk as well. Resistance to change of agile adoption is a big showstopper. So we need buy-in of the executive team and making sure that they are pushing to address uh, these uh, as a matter of priority. Alignment of teams, making sure that we involve every team into uh, the conversations. Stakeholder management. If you have a large agile transformation with 500 stakeholders and a lot of them are decision makers, how can you make them all happy? You can't. So it's all about making sure that these petitions are uh, set uh, before even delivering anything. And uh, that makes it a bit easier. Products versus project. You know very well that when you're an agile organization, you should start thinking about products. So that's what you're delivering. It's not a project anymore. Workflow, work, uh, frameworks and tools. We spoke a lot about that. And to me, uh, it's quite an important point. Uh, we believe that unless large organizations are ready uh, with frameworks and tools and processes in place, it will be very, very difficult. Uh, I call it the six month rule, actually. I think that organizations sometimes embark in these transformations and they think, yeah, I will do that. Uh, but then they take about six months to get up and running. 
at full speed. This is something that can be compressed when you have the right uh, approach. Keeping everything as much out of the box as possible, that always works. And making sure you empower your team. Again, we spoke about the power of guilds and how powerful they are because they bring everyone at the same level. Exactly the point. If you make sure that your, your teams can own their decision, for sure, they are much more successful. Now, I'm going to show you a little demo, just a few minutes, of an example of how we actually implemented an end-to-end -end large agile transformation using frameworks and tools. And it's also a different voice, so maybe it's a bit better than a little music. Uh, <laughs> and we used the Gartner uh, Quadrant uh, uh, best products in uh, the enterprise architecture and in delivery space. Uh, uh, we partner with software G and business design. And I think it's quite exciting to see them in, uh, working. There's actually a little demo. So if you don't mind, I'll just launch the video. Hopefully we're ready to go. Welcome to the demonstration session of the Bruhati Architecture Design and Delivery Framework for Agile Digital Transformation. Ben, Bob, Ben represents some of the core stakeholders involved in the digital transformation journey. The digital transformation value chain starts with strategy definition, then portfolio of changes planned. Change initiatives are organized in releases that are delivered and then moved to go live service. Delivery, business and solution stakeholders are involved throughout the full transformation value chain and use the Bruhati architecture design and delivery framework and tools to seamlessly collaborate and drive the end-to-end -end process. Business executives start the value chain transformation journey defining the organization's strategic themes. This is achieved through the use of the delivery layer tool set. In this example, it involves a Jira Kanban board. The next step in the transformation journey involves business executives and delivery leaders. They are planning change initiatives, assigning budget and program priorities. In this example, JIRA is used to organize themes and epics in releases. When the release delivery work starts, business and delivery team are working on defining epics and user stories in the release. This is still done in JIRA as part of the delivery layer, just before handing over to business layer for process analysis. The fourth step in the digital transformation value chain is to identify business process impacts. After strategic themes, release and epics are defined in JIRA as part of the delivery layer, they are pushed to the process layer, in this case this design, horizon, platform where business architects and analysts are assessing process impacts. In the business layer, the business process hierarchy is refined and high-level processes are created. When those are completed, business layer is pushing the request to the solution architecture and design team to start with a solution impact assessment. Solutions impacts are now identified using Horizon. For each epic, application impacts are identified. In this example scenario, a release context diagram is automatically created using the list of impacted application in the release. After the diagram is adjusted as required, the solution architect decides to model a set of technical flows that describe how the solution behaves to meet the epics in scope. Application impacts are here represented with a sequence diagram. Other representations can also be used. Let's now look into a couple of scenarios where digital transformation stakeholders can leverage the Brahati architecture, design and delivery framework reporting capabilities. Any stakeholder can access the business, delivery and solution dashboards to perform analysis and impact assessments. In this example, we are assessing the dependencies of the product selection strategic theme. The app navigation page is used to select the theme's landscape. This is a very easy way to perform an impact assessment. Custom dashboards can be easily configured to control all different aspects of business, delivery and solution of your digital transformation. 
You can, for example, measure your delivery velocity, control artifact status, generate dynamically release, and domain application business, data, and technology architectures. Remember that the Brahati framework is tool agnostic and can be tailored to your organization tool set and needs. Call Brahati for a free consultation. Brahati, innovative digital transformation. Okay, I'll move back to the presentation. So, I'm ready for questions. If you want to see more information, you can go on our website anyway. The um, thing I wanted to say here is, uh, I believe it's quite important to see how during the delivery process, agile transformation can actually be achieved with the supportive tools. And they can actually help getting the mindset if, if some organizations are ready for it. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Manuel. Really, really interesting talk. And, uh, and I know from, from the conversation that our other panelists have, have, have got some, some questions um, that, that they'd like to put to you. And then, and then we've got a few questions from, from the comments. So um, I suppose, um, Chris, um, would you like to go first in terms of your question? Sure. Yeah. Uh, great presentation, Manuel. I was just wondering, you know, part of agility and, you know, architecture and things like that, what we found is that it's often to do with continual improvement, you know, being able to break the improvement down into smaller, uh, effectively, you know, you know, basically pallet sizes in order to deliver. Uh, have you got any thoughts about how architecture and architecture frameworks can, you know, stimulate the ability to kind of break things down yeah absolutely uh, thank you very much uh, for the great question yes uh, we do believe that uh, this is actually very much achievable uh, if the right framework is there this can actually be con helping to continuously measure and adapt the direction of the program in fact uh, every big uh, large transformation at the moment works trying to define their product as a minimum viable product and then instantly measure and measure through the, uh, the delivery life cycle. Uh, from my experience, having the ability to see where you're going, especially when you're driving this big transformation train, is what really makes the difference. And it helps also the architecture team taking the right decision at the right time. Because even within the architecture team, there are a lot of decisions. Sometimes people really like to push things in. But do you think that work can be measured? And then the right one can be can be performed. Uh, I also think, uh, Chris, the continuous feedback loop. So once you've pushed something out into live, you're always getting feedback uh, in terms of maybe customer feedback. It may be improvement. It may be uh, return on investment. So you're doing these additional tweaks that get put into your uh, sprints or your backlog, and then you're going to feed that in and make sure that's developed in the next release. So I think that's quite critical is that continuous feedback loop as part of the framework. Thank you. Maya, I think you, you had a question as well. Yeah, I do. Um, you talk a lot. I think I understand your question now once uh, I have seen your talk. Um, you talk a lot about the structures, processes, and tools on your talk, but I won't there. How do you measure the engagement and the happiness of your teams? Does it matter at all? It does matter a lot. And in fact, uh, I think uh, we said at the, at the end on the lessons learned, we put people at the first and tools also as a support. But it's like a house. Unless uh, you build the, the, the foundation then uh, and then the wall, then you can build the roof. And uh, you're absolutely right. You need a solid foundation, which I think is also a process and a culture. And this is the foundation. Together with both, then you can build your house. Okay. I've got another question as well. When you have clients approaching you. Just to, sorry, just on that one, I think what's really critical, what we're finding in these big transformations are business and IT coming together. So it's really important that they're not working in silos. They're working in product teams or in scrums or squads and they're working together as this unit and realizing what they can deliver together so i think that of people coming together is really empowering and in, in the world we're in now to deliver things i think that's quite crucial not working in silos 
Beautiful. Thank you so much. And my other question was about when you have a client approaching you that they want this digital transformation, how do you first approach this? That's a great question. Uh, I believe that it's all about maturity level. And uh, there are many different uh, factors that uh, are influencing successful transformation. Independently, if it's uh, agile or not agile or business led or technical led, uh, first thing to do is making sure you understand the current ecosystem and how are they organized, what kind of processes, different type of maturity levels. That helps to get and define the agile introduction assessment and also a transformation assessment. Uh, also try and understand their objectives, business objectives, strategy and needs, because everyone is different. So there are some core principles on how to approach it, but then the outcome of it is always uh, up to the customer and what the customer really wants out of it. Okay. Thank you. Um, uh, sorry, back to, yeah, sorry, just on Manuel's point, I think just the key points is just understanding what the critical needs are. You know, before you bring technology into it, it's just what is the organization looking to achieve? What is the business benefit? Uh, and understanding that, I think, is so critical because it's you can go into a path which is technology led, and I just don't believe, I think you need to understand what are the business capabilities, what is the business looking to achieve, and then evolve your technology around that, you know, because putting the customer and is probably the most important thing, I would imagine, uh, understanding the customer's needs, the end customer. Go, thank you, Sai. Um, and just finally, um, some questions from, from the, the comment section. Um, so we've got, um, Pradeep asks, um, do you think in large organisations there's too many technical um, design authorities that hinder the progress of delivery teams? Well, great question. Uh, for sure, uh, there is a big challenge trying to make everyone happy, and that always happens. I think it's about making sure you identify the people which are more pragmatic. If you have an agile approach, decision making is everything. And uh, making sure that you build your squads correctly, or anyway, the teams that are going to work on it, and empower them to take the decision. If those are technical uh, um, design authorities, or it can be a business authority, surely one of the big tendencies nowadays is to make sure that you always have a strong business representation has a little bit of technical knowledge as well, leading those groups. That to me helps putting everything together. But in the end, it's about group effort. And the the, the, the final question, um, we, we've had a comment from this process looks like safe. Um, and it's like, what, what do you think, Manuel? Yeah, so we are, we're influenced, uh, we, we quoted safe many times because safe is one uh, a big example that we uh, are bringing today because I was explaining before that our latest biggest transformation uh, was delivered using that type of approach. But what uh, we, and so we believe it's a very good framework. And uh, personally, I believe that uh, uh, there are uh, things that can make things easy when you approach a very complex challenge. And this is one of these. Uh, but together with it, you also need the right set of tools and principles and frameworks, processes, templates. It doesn't come out of the thin air. If things are not defined up front, you have to define them later. I can tell you it's been the good six months rule I was talking about. I've seen it happening many times in my career. Uh, I was part of the Accenture uh, team as well. I've done some, many large transformation and I always seen that talk happening over and over again. So sometimes a reference framework is not uh, the full answer, but it's a great way of starting uh, a transformation journey. 